way when you're ready. All right. Uh, thank you, Patrick, for that uh, kind of introduction. Uh, so yes, um, as you can kind of tell from the time slide, this is going to be a kind of really sort of breezy overview. Um, if you were at the pocket flat iron, it's going to be a bit less breezy than that, but um, it'll still be wide ranging nonetheless. But so feel feel free, please, to interrupt. Um, so broadly speaking, I want to start uh, by motivating guys your line test mapping in the first place. Why do you want to do this thing? That we call line test mapping, um, and then once that motivation is hopefully established, I want to talk about the specific experiments that I'm involved in, namely CLMAP here, uh, which recently re released a bunch of early science papers uh, late last year, and then these other millimeter wave line test mapping experiments targeting high rates of C2, time, and uh, feast. So I want to talk about the status of those experiments. I also want to talk about the long-term root map or line test mapping. Uh, in the next several decades, as you know, as experiments develop, and also as uh, the science continues to develop. Um, now, this is a relatively nascent field, but that doesn't mean it was born last Friday. Uh, try more like last Friday, ten years ago. Uh, this is when the final report for the first billion years report, uh, uh, final report for the first billion years study at the Keck Institute for Space Studies was submitted. Uh, this was a series of workshops that ran between 2010 and 12, 2011 at Caltech. And one of the key priorities. Yeah, one of the. I think we should have seen. Right there. Yeah. Right there. Mm -hmm. Whoa, whoa. Um, and so one of the key things that was identified. Um, let me zoom in. Um, first one you've seen, but then also you know, on this text here. One of the key things that was identified, as part of that you know, study into the first billion years was detection of unresolved spectral line emission from galaxies during ionization, in particular looking at CO and C two. So. What does this mean? What is it? What does this talk about detecting unresolved line emission? Well, to think about you know why we want to do such a thing, we need to talk about what we talk about when we talk about the first billion years, and that means taking a step back and looking at the big picture, right? The entire history of the universe can't get to a bigger picture than that. So, you know, thinking about the cosmic history all the way from recombination at the CMB. All the way up to the present sort of dark energy, dark energy dominated uh, present day, um, we actually have had a lot of advances in understanding various points in this cosmic history. At the very start, we have CMB and its free measurements from experiments like doubling map, Planck, and then from the ground, the ACT, SBT, Bicep Keck, all these experiments have made exquisite measurements of the CMB angular power spectrum, validated the standard model of cosmology. In a really big way by doing these wide area surveys. And then in the local universe, you know, out to redshift one or you know, two, we have measurements of all of these galaxies, all of these quasars a little further out, um, making exquisite measurements of large scale structure, baryon acoustic oscillations, and so forth. So we have really good large scale pictures of the primordial universe and the local universe. What about the middle part, right? So what's, what's going to take the place of, you know, these kinds of large scale structure probes at these intermediate redshifts? Because there's a lot to study here, right? Um, post, re post recombination, you know, a lot of this is sort of dark ages. There's nothing really luminous to study, maybe apart from neutral hydrogen. But then things start kicking off within the first billion years with, you know, the whole process of cosmic ionization. Once the you know matter starts you know collapsing on itself to start forming protostars and protogalaxies, and then these ionized bubbles start forming, growing until the entire universe becomes reionized. You know the neutral ion kind of disappears um, from you know so the universe goes from opaque to transparent. Following the process of reionization, we continue to see the evolution of stars and galaxies until we see the kind of galaxy we organize today, and throughout that process. So the cosmic star formation rate average continues to grow and grow and grow up to around redshift two or three when it starts declining. Now, you know, when I say things like, you know, up to or around redshift two or three, or when I say reionization ends around redshift six to eight, you can kind of tell there are a lot of open questions about the exact details of this history, you know. When does reionization end? Uh, what is, you know, the primary driver of reionization? What is the exact cosmic star formation history at early times and so forth? 
So there are a lot of open questions about these processes. Um, and there's a powerful tool that came in, you know, came into fashion, you know, over the past, you know, over this, you know, over the past uh, decade or two, which is looking at the cosmic infrared background. So we realized collectively as a community that, you know, the cosmic infrared background actually has a significant contribution from dusty star from galaxies, unresolved, but, you know, take, you know, with all this dust, you know, reprocessing the UV radiation from newly formed stars, re-emitting in the IR. And so this CIB and these broadband measurements basically shows you the clustering signature of the star formation history of the universe. So you can go apply some kind of halo model, uh, fit it to the CIB data, and you can come up with this kind of starting history. The slight problem is you can also come up with this kind of starting history from the CIB. Um, because of the relative lack of planet-side information, um, it is easy to run into these kinds of degeneracies, um, which could be resolved with cross correlations with things like lensing, but there are lots of systematics that make this kind of thing a little bit uncertain. Now, this is where, line, you know, if you're using spectral lines instead of a, you know, polar metrics or continued luminosity, start to come in. And the thing is, um, certainly locally, we have very rich spectral lines that are associated quite tightly with obscure star formation activity, the infrared luminosity, basically. There are lines like carbon monoxide and ionized carbon. And we'll get into how these relate to star, star forming activity in a little bit. But essentially, if you have these spectral lines, you can try and imagine trying to probe the fluctuation in sort of the total integrated line emission in those particular species and trying to measure those fluctuations instead of something like the CIB and SHP, or indeed, instead of trying to resolve individual redshifts across a large cosmic volume at high redshift. So you still, you know, in this kind of line testing mapping analysis, you're still only trying to resolve the clustering signature of the total emission or out of the fluctuations of that total emission. So you're still not trying to resolve individual objects. Unlike the CIB or the CMB, this is still a spectral measurement though. So you're still retaining three dimensional information. And you can see in terms of, you know, how bright is it over the continuum? Well, here is something like CO10, 21, 32. Here's something like C2. These are very bright lines over the sort of infrared continuum. For this kind of hypothetical high redshift galaxy. And you can see, you know, for example, you know, these are much brighter lines than HCN, HO plus, you know, N2 oxygen lines. So you can see why the CO and C2 lines in particular were called out by that particular year study. Um, in terms of what we would measure, we wouldn't really measure the sort of fluctuations uh, per se, rather, we would be looking at the summary statistics of your sort of spatial spectral data cube um, and measuring the summary statistics of the line intensity field in forms of like the power spectrum here, shown here, the spherical average power spectrum as a function of wave number. And sort of the simplest linear halo model, you're looking at a uh, two component power spectrum. Uh, scale independent shot noise associated with Poisson noise coming from you know, the discrete nature of line emitters. And then a clustering component, which is basically the matter power spectrum scaled by some kind of clustering amplitude, which incorporates information both about the average line bias and about the line luminosity. So this is the basic idea, right? You have your spatial spectral data cube, which has buried in there somewhere these fluctuations, which not only trace the brightest galaxies, but also these fainter structures, these filaments, and the cosmic web. Once you have that data, once you have those data, you can generate the statistics of the underlying line intensity field. And you can go from the line intensity field statistics to astrophysical inferences, maybe in cosmological inferences like the EO scales and so forth. And so this is a very, very compelling idea to try and probe the high redshift universe in three dimensions. So Line density mapping is not a new idea, certainly in general, 21 centimeter density mapping has been motivated for a very long time, accumulated a lot of different experimental collaborations. But over the past decade, I think we've seen a lot of momentum in line density mapping 
with these other with these other spectral lines like CO, C2, and maybe even optical lines like H help for H beta, oxygen lines, fine help, and so forth. And so, you know, these three experiments in particular are the ones that I'm going to talk about during the seminar. Um, I will briefly note, sort of as a last uh, instrumentalist, that uh, my general opinion is that of the three camps here, CO and C2 may potentially have the easiest time to an initial detection. The 20 centimeter line is a sure thing. It's a sure bet. Uh, neutral hydrogen is everywhere. Or neutral IGM is everywhere. It's a really compelling science case to programization using this uh, 20 centimeter line. The only problem is the foregrounds, not just the radio interference, but also galactic synchrotron and free free, and the way that mixes into the instrumental response of these uh, very large interferometers. Meanwhile, on the optical side, um, something like SphereX, uh, you know, there's a very direct link to an upskirt star formation with these with these lines like H alpha. Uh, the only complication there, I think, is that there's really poor atmosphere opacity in the near infrared from the ground, so you need to go to space. And indeed, SphereX has rightly been funded as a mid-X to go to space and Amongst this myriad science cases, do some kind of extra collective background mapping. Um, line deconfusion is potentially a problem, but I won't get into that too, too much right now. Um, and CO and C2 is kind of a more agile niche, in my opinion, where you can do observations from the ground, single dish, interferometer, whatever you want, with continued foregrounds, uh, pretty low if you're familiar with that sort of synchrotron free free versus dust sort of valley and that. 30 to 300 gigahertz area. Um, so this is a this is a potentially very fertile sort of experimental ground, uh, very fertile experimental niche for initial detection with this line testing mapping technique. So perhaps for this reason, this first billion year study out of the Keck Institute funded two technical technical development programs, uh, one in CO and one is C plus or C2. These have led to two experiments that I'm going to talk about today, CO map and time. So let's get to CO map. This is the CO map engineering project. Now why CO? Well, uh, the reason we uh, probe CO oftentimes is because is because H2 is symmetric. Molecular hydrogen, of course, is going to be the most abundant molecular species, but it's symmetric. There's no like dipole. It doesn't emit any lines and rotational transitions. CO is asymmetric. So it's one of the more, you know, more, more common brighter molecular lines out there. There's trying to trace molecular gaps. CO has been used successfully in untargeted line searches at high redshift already. Uh, surveys like Cold Z uh, with the VLA and the aspects with ALMA have already constrained the need to the bright end of the CO luminosity function at redshift three. And so when the Pathfinder experiment for COMAP goes after this signal here, you know, this is frequency versus redshift. And so if the COMAP Pathfinder is going after this signal here, the CO10 at redshift three, uh, and the line testing mapping observations uh, are summarized in the statistics of both the faint and the bright CO emitters, you can see that we're going to complement those data pretty nicely by considering the faint end that the VLA and all more observations don't see. And of course, long term, we want to be able to go out to redshift 7, redshift 8, this randomization epoch, the complement 21st century observations. And that means uh, the CO lines have a particular advantage in providing this whole ladder of rotational transitions that we can cross correlate across. So, long term, the uh, vision for the project is to build 15 gigahertz instrumentation as well as this 30 gigahertz instrumentation, which is where the Pathfinder is. And cross correlate between these CO transitions in order to really nail down the CO signal at randomization. Nonetheless, the Pathfinder is also really valuable because this signal here from redshift three from cosmic noon is going to be way brighter than anything in this, you know, redshift eight, seven regime. Uh, so going after that is going to be a really vital proof ground for both sort of technical development and uh, analysis as well. So the project is led by Kieran Cleary, a staff scientist at Caltech. 
Uh, the site is also operated by Caltech. This is out in the Owens Valley Radio Observatory, where Karma used to be. In fact, this is this used to be a Karma dish before it was dedicated for its human observations. And it's thanks to the work of all of these people, including Patrick uh, and myself, um, and you know, funding from the NSF, the Keck Institute, Pipec at Stanford. Uh, it's thanks to all of this uh, funding and all of this effort that we were able to come out with these early science papers uh, late last uh, late last year. These preprints were all announced last November. As of the end of last week, they were all accepted by the Astrophysical Journal, and uh, they're basically in press right now. So you can see that these early science papers span a lot of ground. Right there's a big early paper, but then there's paper on the instruments. The pipeline, the bar spectrum methodology, and then of course the actual line testing mapping science at Roger 3, as well as some galactic science that we did with this instrument. And of course, Patrick led the paper looking at the randomization prospects with CMAP. So let's sort of go through these bit by bit. The Pathfinder is kind of a massive instrument. So 19 pixels does not sound impressive. Uh, but you ought to see this in person. These feed horns are huge. They're like 30 centimeters tall. Um, the, the, the dish, again, is an X karma dish. It's a 10 meter dish. It's an odd axis design, which is not ideal for these kinds of surveys. But we take what we can get. Um, we modified certain aspects of the optical design, like the secondary reflector, in order to optimize for various systematics. The detectors themselves are long noise amplifiers using monolithic microwave uh, integrated circuitry. They operate cryogenically, noise temperatures around 10K, uh, contributing to a total system temperature of around 35 to 45 Kelvin. Uh, you can see a picture from the receiver cabin, which just looks like a giant mess of wires. This is our spectrometer. Um, the signals go through two downconverging stages, um, and then once it's out of those downconverging stages, it goes into these, uh, this massive stack of 3D merge ports, which actually do the sideband separation through the actual spectrometry. Um, this, to our knowledge, is one of the largest such systems that exists in certainly by simultaneous bandwidth. So this is the kind of instrument that we're pointing at the sky. And where are we going at the sky? We're pointing at three different fields, each around four square degrees. The principal motivation it's kind of illustrated here. We actually overlap with the survey fields of Hepdex, which is a Lyman alternative survey, covering very much the same range that we do with CO10 with the Pathfinder. Uh, ignore this part. This, this didn't quite work out, but uh, we'll work it out. Um, other than Hepdex, we also overlap with Sloan and the EBOS footprint. The zero deck field also overlaps with Tribe 82. And of course, there are other considerations. You can see that. Um, these are in pretty dark areas of the Planck 30 gigahertz continuum map. Uh, the survey uh, normally is going to go for five years. Our first season started at the start of July 2019 and ended at the end of July 2020, so 13 months of observing. That is the extent of the data that was used for our early science papers. Um, because it's the first season, we are playing a lot with observing parameters, um, both for the instrumentation, but also more importantly, for the scanning parameters. So this is a very conservative way to scan across the sky, where you're fixing elevation, doing these constant elevation scans, slimming only an azimuth, and then stepping once in a while as the field drifts across the sky. This looks like someone took a spirograph to your field. Um, the, these are, you know, listed you patterns. And these are, this is a kind of pattern we tested in order to see if the improvements in things like cross-linking, um, you know, just coming out the sky, um, same part of the sky, but in different directions, um, and, you know, the sort of reduced acceleration strain on the telescope, if all that kind of, if all those kinds of benefits were worth the potential additional introduction of ground-based systematics based off this um, scan pattern. So, um, when you scan across the sky like that, you're going to end up with a lot of elevation, not a lot of air mass dependent uh, signal. Of course, whether it's the constant elevation scan 
or the list you type scan, all the data, which comes in 10 minute chunks, goes through four filtering steps. Um, there is a you divide out by rolling mean, you subtract out a ground template, which is just basically coming from fitting to air mass and azimuth. You fit a linear fit across each sideband, um, and that is meant to really remove things like galactic foregrounds, CMB, these kinds of spectrally smooth foregrounds that are certainly present in our data. In this case, though, it also seems to have the effect of uh, removing some correlated noise, you know, these large scale atmospheric fluctuations as well. The final filtering step that we apply is the removal of a, a modes determined by principal component analysis across the whole data segment. So the combination of these four fields, you can see, you start with very, very jagged sorts of uh, time order data, and you end up with, certainly on visual inspection, very wide noise. You can verify this more quantitatively with a uh, lot of the power spectral density. You can see that the ground template subtraction takes care of this sort of scan frequency uh, systematic, and the combination of the frequency space filter and the PCA filter then remove any sort of one over F sort of frequency dependent noise, and you end up with a flat PST, which is what you want. You want white noise, you get white noise. There are other steps on top of this that need to happen, because we're not just measuring this, we're trying to measure power spectrum. Um, and so, you know, the excess power spectrum we need to scan, you know, excess correlations between certain frequency channels, these are other kinds of data selection steps that need to happen. Um, in terms of going from you know those data to the maps and to the power spectrum, we use a feed feed to the cross spectrum method. If you're familiar with CMB analysis, this is basically akin to you know uh, split C of L techniques. You split the data up in segments that um, span different kinds of you know ground based things like the feed number or the elevation selection, but you're looking at the same cosmological field. So if you cross correlate those fields, um, if you cross correlate those data sets, you're looking at the same fields through different feeds or at different elevations. So you're only left with the CO signal in principle. You can also do null tests with these kinds of cross correlations, you know, cross correlating across data sets that span different fields. Now these null tests pass for constant elevation scans data, but they fail for the list you type scans and that means we actually discard all the data taken with the list use tell scans. We certainly won't be using those in the future. It seems like it does ex introduce excess systematics that we can't control. But we can't control the systematics of the constant elevation data scan. Because as you can see, the final PP to the cross spectrum, drum rule, is consistent with zero at all wave numbers. And the average of taken across the entire wave number range is also basically consistent with zero. Uh, at least it's not statistically significantly away from zero. This means we have a fairly robust uh, measurement of nothing, which is what we expect. It's only our first season. We've only accrued so much observing time on sky. And this allows us to derive a very robust upper limit on the CO plus power spectrum. So uh, this is where, my, where the paper that I like comes in. And so this is showing you the upper limit from the COMAP early science result against the variety of models, as well as uh, certain observational limits. So this measurement, even though it's the first measurement in the clustering regime, is preceded by this COPS measurement. So this is the CO power spectrum survey. It's an interferometric survey. And so it is really restricted to smaller scales that tend to be dominated by shot noise. So you can interpret this point in two different ways, either as a you know integral sort of power spectrum measurement at this range, where it's probably dominated by shot noise, or you can interpret it as sort of a rather constraint on shot noise around this general estimate and potentially up to this much clustering. So you can see that because it's at such high k, such small scales, the measurement uh, from CO map improves on this clustering uh, constraint by an order of magnitude. We also additionally exclude certain models for the CO power spectrum 
that were previously consistent with this cost measurement. Uh, so this is actually really valuable. It cuts down the sort of model space in half because these models are still viable. These models are not viable anymore. We'll revisit the idea of what it means for these models to be viable or not. Uh, and you know, as I said, you know, the clustering constraint is better by an order of magnitude than COPS. Just to illustrate this in a different way, uh, we consider the sort of two-dimensional constraints on the clustering amplitude by which we scale the matter power spectrum and sort of the shot noise amplitude. This is what you get with the COPS data by itself, and the CIOM data improves on this by an order of magnitude. Um, and these are the kind of constraints you get from a joint analysis of year one of CIOM data and COPS data. So this is all uh, this is all really fun. Uh, but before I move away from CMAP, I do want to touch on uh, quick diversion. Since we're really running low on time, I don't have much time to go into this. But suffice it to say that when you design a spectrometer to try and try and uh, detect extragalactic backgrounds, these these instruments are more than suitable to also survey really faint regions in our own galaxy, as well as certain extragalactic targets. So our collaborators at Manchester and Caltech are running what is the first large-scale 30 gigahertz contim survey with, you know, the CL map resolution is basically, you know, four or five arc minutes. This is the first kind of, you know, large-scale survey with that kind of resolution. In particular, the coverage and frequency of CL map places it very nicely to probe uh, anomalous pipe wave emission, uh, which may or may not be spinning dust. The opinion seems to change every, every so often. So, um, the Manchester folks are working really hard on all kinds of different science for the pocket plane survey, but they uh, provided this uh, initial first look as part of the early science series. So this is 10% you know, of the, the eventual coverage. You can see that, for example, in this region, uh, these are the CMAP points. These are points from other telescopes, other surveys. And you can see that uh, we make a convincing case for an AMI model here. And in terms of looking at W43, we also see these radio recombination lines uh, detected quite confidently. So I thought that was interesting. I uh, uh, thought that was an interesting uh, thing to do with this instrument. So this is a really good use of time that we don't have on, uh, uh, on the line testing mapping fields. So Patrick led the, the final paper in this series, which is looking at this promise uh, long term of the project to look at redshift seven. And so uh, the potential sort of straw concept we laid out in this paper is duplicating the 30 gigahertz instrumentation a few times and also building up this uh, 15 gigahertz instrumentation. In fact, we already have uh, an agreement with the NGBLA project to use their prototype dish uh, starting sometime in around 2026. So building sort of a concept around what we call CMF EOR, around this sort of timeline. We can imagine that um, in the same way that we expect Pathfinder constraints to complement surveys with the VLA, we will expect CMF EOR constraints at Reg of 7 to nicely complement what the NGVLA can do. So next gen VLA will really only survey CO emitters around or above the knee of the luminosity function and it's going to be up to experiments like CMAP that can trace the, 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 the statistics of both bright and faint galaxies to really capture the full clustering amplitude of the CO. You may end up with a model like this where there isn't a substantial excess from the vein end. You may also end up with a model like this where there is. And something like CMAP may be the only way to discriminate between these two kinds of models. Um, and, you know, this will enable us to really probe the cosmic molecular gas history all the way from Retro 3, where we currently have this kind of limit from the early science result, all the way out to Retro 7. So I think this is terribly exciting. Um, and uh, I think this is terribly exciting. And we certainly are continuing efforts to develop instrumentation at the lower frequency band to enable this kind of science. So, what are our takeaways? We don't detect anything. And that's a really good thing right now because we shouldn't. 
the fact that we produced this really clean data consistent with the expectations given our current observing time is a really good sign that we're able to currently control our systematics. And the resulting constraints on the CO power spectrum are actually already quite meaningful. Now, of course, as we continue to add observing time, as you continue to integrate down on these fields, we will certainly see other systematics rise out of the phone, but only if we stand still, sit on our first generation pipeline and do nothing. Our collaborators at Oslo are more vigilant than that. They continue to work on enhancing the pipeline, enhancing the cleaning capability uh, to work to match the future noise levels that will certainly reveal systematics if we don't do anything. And of course, on the US middle side, we're also continuing to plan uh, lower frequency instrumentation as well as additional instrumentation of the Pathfinder band. So that's basically the general status of CO map, which is also the general status of single dish centimeter wave intensity mapping because there's really no other experiment that does this. It's going to be a different story when we get to millimeter wave. And so when I talk about millimeter wave, I'm really talking principally about experiments operating around 200 to 300 gigahertz, trying to map a uh, high redshift C2, you know, from epoch randomization redshift 6 to 8. And C2 is an attractive option to try and study these galaxies from the very early universe. C2 is also a bright line. You can see in this hypothetical CD here, it's quite bright above the continuum CD. It's been observed to be as bright as 0.1 to 1% of the total infrared luminosity. Empirically, correlation between C2 luminosity and star formation rate or IR luminosity is really good. But causality is a little bit unclear, especially because C2 is supposed to be associated with more diffuse media. But there is a strong empirical correlation that suggests it's a really good signpost for star formation activity, at least for low galaxies. And we think that may extend to high range of galaxies based on various observations of normal star forming galaxies with ALMA. And of course, the fact that it's associated with more sort of diffuse or ionized or neutral media means that it's going to be less dependent on, you know, with something like CO, you need really good, you know, well shielded molecular clouds that don't photo dissociate. Uh, whereas with um, C2, you may not be as worried in the same way by dust poor galaxies being more prevalent in high redshift. So scientifically, it seems like C2 is quite attractive. But if I go back into my lapsed sort of instrumentalist mode, uh, this is what I kind of see when I look at millimeter wave, right? So there's the atmospheric opacity. It's a right mess. There are lots of different absorption lines and I kind of mess with the atmospheric transmission. This in itself is not too much of a problem, uh, especially because a lot of these C2 experiments tend to be sort of lower resolution, a resolving power of order 100. Um, the other cause for concern, though, is that here's the C2 line brightness as a function of observing frequency. So it's 300 to 300 gigahertz, going from much of 5 to much 8. So the three problems I see here are CO32, CO43, and CO54. All of these are potentially a lot brighter coming from redshift uh, you know, 0 to 2 than the C2 line coming from sort of tail end of brownization. This is not a problem with that we have with CO, by the way. Uh, the foreground lines for CO are really mostly dense molecular gas lines like HCN, HCO+, which are going to be an order of magnitude dimmer. This is several times brighter. Now, this is not a deal breaker because people have thought about this, people have studied the idea of masking these foreground CO lines based on uh, ancillary data, looking at galaxy catalogs, identifying potential sources of CO, masking these out. And certainly in these kinds of theoretical tests, uh, it's been shown that this can really successfully recover a C2 signal with uh, foreground masking. Other techniques are under study, things like exploiting projection effects, uh, exploiting, uh, oh, excuse me, yeah, exploiting uh, projection effects or anisotropies, phase space effects, and things like that. So let me sort of backtrack here a little bit. Um, so Shang-Chi is asking if the next generation CO map survey will be able to route some of the current CO <coughs> models. 
because the current pathfinder measurement has no strong constraints. I would potentially maybe stay tuned for the next over the next few years. Um, based on you know the forecasts uh, for year five results at the end of the novel pathfinder survey, it's possible we may actually be able to distinguish at high significance uh, between some of these other models. And again, I'll return to what it means to really exclude or include these other models. But the but the point is, um, at the end of year one, this is where we stand. By the end of year five, this is where we'll stand because we'll make significant improvements to observing their deficiency uh, analysis. And so going from this to this um, will not be just a five-fold increase in sensitivity. So we expect to have really good constraints on the CO density power spectrum, certainly for the models in this range. Um, so then I'll return a little bit to what it means to include or exclude these models later on, but that's what I can say for now. Yeah, sure. Um, let me return to C2. So again, you know, foregrounds, not necessarily a deal breaker, ways of uh, circumventing them, uh, but it's still a challenging measurement. And maybe because it's such a challenging measurement, unlike with COMAP, which is the only centimeter wave single dish game in town, there are actually three whole experiments looking at trying to map high redshift C2 with a single dish telescope. Uh, Concerto is the only one I'm not working on. Uh, this is run by the French uh, out of Apex in the Chachon du Plateau in Chile. Uh, there are, of course, other experiments like SPT Slim, Explain, which Anthony is involved in, and the Terahertz intensity mapper. These are either aiming at lower frequencies, looking at lower redshift CO exclusively, or looking at uh, lower redshift C2 at high frequencies from these balloon based experiments. Uh, for now, let me talk principally about time and feast. So time is, well, time is a contrived acronym, but uh, other than that, it's also uh, one of the other offshoots of the Keck study, as I mentioned at the start. So this is led by Abby Kreitz out of Cornell. Um, perhaps because it's sort of heritage from sort of a 10 year old survey, it's more conservative, both in its instrumentation and in its survey strategy. It's serving a really small area, as you can see, you know, a degree wide by a beam tall. So this is basically like trying to figure out the minimum viable way to detect the C2 power spectrum at high redshift. Now the instrument has, it has been built. We've undergone commissioning runs at the Arizona Radio Observatory in Pitt Peak, where we have the 12 meter dish for the winter time. We did a commissioning run two years ago and one just this past winter. And based on those results, we are cautiously optimistic about beginning full science operations sometime in 2023. When we undertake that full thousand hour survey, well, Jason Sun uh, recently, uh, just um, at the end of 2020, put out this uh, updated forecast paper, which suggests that we should be able to detect the C2 power spectrum at sort of a total five to six sigma level at both stretch of six and stretch of seven. Now, Kent Peak is actually not the greatest site to observe in millimeter wave. It's possible that there is a future project that will allow time to undertake further operations out of a site in the Chatham for Plateau, in which case you can see these inner error bars here is where we would end up. Significantly improved the detection significance owing to the better site and the additional integration time. Um, so as I said, we just had a commission run last year, uh, not last year, just this past winter. Here's our fearless PI supervising the lift of the receiver from the dome floor up to the receiver cabin. I got there after all the hard work was done, ready to just take pretty pictures with the receiver. Not, not the cell phone, the receiver. Now, it's a period pandemic deployment. So obviously, a lot of the work had to be done, debugging things over Zoom. There was limited site capacity. You can see just two people from time, the site team in the control room, and the operator is sort of sitting across from me. And then Victoria, who's a PhD student at uh, Rochester, is supervising some, some uh, software debugging remotely. But um, you know, we get things done. So here's like me trying to optimize the focus of the telescope um, with Jupiter. And you can see that we end up with, so here's some astrophysical imagery uh, from this commissioning run, right? So here's the Orion molecular cloud complex. You can see that not only do we see these uh, you know, clumps, 
and also resolve a lot of the diffuse wings, this kind of structure, with minimal difficulty. This was a day with really good observing weather. On the right here is, this was a continuum map, this is a spectroscopic map. This is of Sagittarius A, the central molecular zone of our galaxy. It's a false color map. You can see it's very orange, maybe, if the lighting's right. And it's very orange because 230 gigahertz is mapped to orange in this color scheme. So the CO2 one line is brighter in flux by 10 times more than anything else in this region. If you mask out the 230 gigahertz channel, you can see these uh, clumps a little more, bit more clearly, as well as the circumnuclear disk here. In particular, the color differences between the circumnuclear disk and these 50 kilometer per second, 20 kilometer per second clumps are actually reflecting real differences in the environments with the spectral index of these regions. Of course, there's further analyses we need to undertake in terms of better understanding the instrument, optics, and all of that based on the data from this commissioning run. But based on what we've seen so far, we are cautiously optimistic about the 2023 start date. So let me move quickly through what BEAST is going to do, because this is, this is a bit further in the future. Not by much, but a little bit. So this is the CCAT Prime Observatory. It's a partnership spanning a variety of American and German institutions. And the CCAT Prime Observatory is going to play host to the Fred Young Sub Millimeter Telescope, named after one of our uh, uh, prominent donors, who was a Cornell alumnus. So this is actually a design that's been optimized highly for wide field surveys. The design is shared with one of the Simons Observatory, uh, one of the Simons Observatory, uh, <coughs> excuse me. The design is shared with one of the Simons Observatory designs. It's highly optimized for wide field surveys, as I said, and it's going to be sighted uh, on Sherwood Chatton Tor. 5,600 meters above sea level, just below the summit, well above the sites for Alma and Apex, where Concerto is hosted. It's a very ambitious survey program, spanning a lot more, a lot more sky area, a lot more hours, really novel instrumentation in terms of the spectrometer architecture, the detectors used, and it's going to higher frequency, which is allowed because we have a really high site. So this is, these are forecasts I drew up for the uh, collaboration paper, Submitted to the double journals. <coughs> and you can see CCAT Prime or Beast, first of all, it's unparalleled at the higher frequencies, at the lower redshifts. There's nothing else that can consistently observe at these frequencies. And the frequencies where other experiments can observe at the higher redshifts, uh, Beast, uh, the survey program is going to actually improve sensitivity to the power spectrum by an order of magnitude versus Concerto uh, or time. And it will enable detection, significant detection of the majority of these models, certainly at much of six. And um, so we've actually been having a collaboration meeting for CCAT Farm and Feast uh, this week while I was visiting. And it, uh, it struck me that the theme of the collaboration meeting was data to science. And <laughs> this is something we had to think about more and more as all of these line testing mapping experiments come online, start taking data, start making measurements. Because not only is it important for us to be able to go from data to measurements, but we also really need to be able to go from measurements to concrete science. So let's talk about that process, right? So jumping back to that CO map plot, right? This is our upper limit. It excludes these two models. Uh, Hansa Bad Malmont's model uh, with FQD is set to one. Don't worry about that too much. And then um, Anthony's model from way back in 2013, this is model B. I'm not showing model A, Anthony, just because it's really close to some of these other models down here. It would make the plot too busy. Apologies. Um, what does it mean for us to exclude these models, though? Right. For Poland and all model B, you can kind of say, well, this model <laughs> estimates a clustering amplitude based on the combination of an empirically measured star formation rate function and a CO to SFR calibration measured from local samples of galaxies. You could say you could argue that you can interpret this exclusion as an exclusion of the local calibration applying to these redshift free galaxies. There's something different about the way CO is related to star formation rate for higher redshift galaxies versus lower redshift galaxies. What about this model? Well, it's a bit more difficult to say. 
Uh, Hamza's model is an abundance matching model really geared towards forecasting CO signals at these redshifts. The primary driver at redshift three in particular is this COPS point. So all you can kind of say is, well, this abundance matching approach driven by other data at redshift zero and driven by this at redshift three seems to overpredict the CO power spectrum. There's not much more you can really say in terms of physical picture that you include or exclude by including or excluding this model. You might say, okay, well, you need to build more physically motivated models that you can include or exclude, and then you will actually include or exclude physical pictures of line emission. For a certain extent, that's true, um, but perhaps not, because if you look at something like semi-analytic model, right, this is, a, this is supposed to be a very physically grounded model uh, linking halo immersion and accretion histories to galaxy properties, galaxy evolution. But to predict things like CO luminosities from SAMs requires a variety of subgroup recipes uh, that can be tweaked, not unreasonably. And Patrick wrote this paper last year showing that based on you know, choices like the molecular cloud profile or assumptions about the excitation of CO in these galaxies, interpreting this MIME measurement, which is an interferometric measurement, um, interpreting this MIME result as a molecular gas history, the interpretation can vary up or down by an order of magnitude, depending on these kinds of separate assumptions. You might then say, well, the separate recipes need to be better informed by things like um, hydro simulations, zoom-in simulations that really examine the baryonic physics of the galaxies in more detail. This also has its limits to a certain extent. So Laura Keating, who uh, was a postdoc at Cedar and is now at Potsdam, um, she wrote this paper looking at the fire simulations, trying to replicate results for CO luminosities and CSH2 conversions at redshift zero, where there's a lot of observational data to try and compare against. Uh, the findings were interesting. So with this sort of default prescription for the shielding length, which is the natural prescription, we find we found a uh, Laura found a significant overprediction of the CO luminosity and a significant underprediction of this conversion factor relative to all the observational results. The interpretation was simple. The fact is that even the zoom-in simulations aren't zoomed in enough. Uh, the of the association of the CO, the radio transfer processes were not being resolved finely enough. As a result, a lot of the CO that should have been dissociated wasn't. And so you're left with excess CO luminosity. You need to tune the subgroup recipes down artificially <coughs> in order for us to match, um, in order for them to match observational results, which is not a place you want to be because there's not a lot of observations at Russia 3, not in the same way as these kind of results. Not with the same kinds of you know reasonably complete selections and you know i'm not i don't have a lot of time remaining here so let me just also add on that the high redshift universe is kind of weird um and observations are limited both by selection but also by you know practical constraints you know what kinds of bands you can observe and marco Biro at the stacking analysis of the cosmos 2020 catalog on a variety of infrared maps spitzer Herschel, scuba 2 and what he found was the stacked SEDs showed really elevated dust temperatures. You know, these are, you know, 60, 80, 100 Kelvin at high, high redshifts. These are much higher dust temperatures than what was measured from all the data for individual objects. Our interpretation of this is simple. The ALMA data are not bracketing the SED fully, the dust SED fully. And as a result, uh, these kinds of dust temperature determinations are not really completely informed. Whereas uh, these stacking analyses span a much wider range of wavelengths, incorporating JCMT data, you know, satellite data. And so uh, these are, you know, these are more completely back in the peak of the SCD. So individual follow-ups are going to be important to confirm this kind of stacking analysis, but certainly there seems to be, you know, where is this going on a high redshift that we can't necessarily anticipate based on the observational data we have for a variety of reasons that doesn't just stop at selection effects. And these kinds of issues are going to be important to sort out uh, if we want to do um, more advanced cosmology with future stages of these line testing mapping experiments. 
So Kira Kalkari, who's at KICB at Chicago, uh, led this white paper for the snow mass process this year. And the upshot here is that uh, here is laid out an instrumental bird map that gets us basically to sort of CMB stage three, stage four tier experiments with millimeter wave line testing mapping, you know, doing spectroscopy, look down after these CO lines, C2 lines. And time scales for these are, you know, 2031, 2037. So it's not unreasonable to think that by next decade, we'll have these, you know, massive experiments uh, going after these uh, line testing mapping signals may, uh, and potentially ending up with really competitive constraints on things like non gaussianity neutrino masses and effective dark energy equation state and so forth. But all of this is contingent on being able to get a handle on the astrophysics. So the modeling, the science really needs to keep up. So what's to do? Um, so if we can't get a physical <coughs> handle on everything, we may as well at least try to get an empirical handle on everything. And that really means taking advantage of all the cross correlations you can find. Uh, this is something that a lot of us in the community have been aware of for a while, so need to enable cross correlations for not just validation, which CLMAP will certainly take advantage of, but also for synergistic time step, which CLMAP will also certainly take advantage of. So as I said, CLMAP was designed to overlap with you know, the Hetex footprint, the BOSS footprint. Uh, Patrick has written a paper before about stacking CLMAP and Quasar catalogs. And indeed, uh, Delaney Dunn, who is a student at Caltech, is working on this kind of stack analysis in real life. Um, Jason, in his forecast for time, uh, looked at possibly correlating uh, a future version of time with a uh, line altimeter survey from Roman. I recently put a preprint saying, well, look, these CO interloper lines in the C2 surveys, they will cross correlate with cosmic shear data. And by doing that, you can actually get a handle simultaneously on the CO astrophysics for the interloper lines and the intrinsic alignments in the cosmic shear data. That's a possibility for a stage three line testing mapping survey cross correlating with something like LSST. So um, I'm well, I think, over time right, at this point. Here, you're doing good. Um, but uh, yeah, let me just end off with the sort of takeaways here. The experimental progress in this niche in general is really picking up. CLMAP has announced early science results. Time is undergoing commissioning now. We're fairly optimistic about that 2023 start date again. And feast. The site has been excavated. They're building the telescope. They're building the instrument at Cornell. Uh, all this development is proceeding. And looking beyond things like time at Feast and current you know, CMI Pathfinder experiments, we're looking at future roadmaps that really build up you know, things like CMI EOR, things like these kinds of you know, SPT, stage four tier surveys uh, by you know, late 2020s, sometime in the 2030s. But the science that these things can do is going to be extremely contingent on the models. We can't fully resolve the fine grain models physically. We can't really anticipate a lot of the high redshift aspects because of the observational shortcomings that exist in high redshift. So in terms of at least building up an empirical picture, we really need to pursue all these kinds of cross correlations between line and density mapping experiments against other line large structure probes. After all, that's where we started, right? We start by saying, we need something to be able to cross correlate against 21 centimeter and realization. That's why we designed these CO and C2 surveys. So, line testing mapping is nothing if not feel born out of a need for cross correlation. And so, it only seems appropriate that it's going to be cross correlation that can be vital for producing interpretable science out of these experiments. So, that's all I had. Uh, I'll now take any questions. All right. Thank you, Dongwu, for a lovely overview of a great deal of science that's happening. A um, couple minutes for a question or two. Um, I can start. Given the modeling difficulties you're talking about, what's your favorite way to move forward on trying to actually model the astrophysics you care about? Um, so in terms of modeling astrophysics, there are a couple of ways to proceed. Um, so the framework we presented for the CON early science was a not physically necessarily motivated, but still sort of flexible model of the galaxy to halo connection. Um, and so that, in terms of cosmological context, for example, is something that we can at least marginalize over sort of competently. Um, and it can be empirically constrained through a combination of autocorrelation, 
puts you know, that and cross correlation with other probes. Um, Certain kinds of astrophysics could actually be resolved. They may not be beyond hope in terms of getting a handle on the simulations. C2, for example, as I said, is coming really from more diffuse or neutral media rather than these molecular clouds. And so that could be something we could try and resolve better with fine-grained models. Um, so there's really no one-size-fits-all approach in the astrophysics. CO, C2, um, all these lines, you know, be very differently. Even the high JCL lines are going to be somewhat differently from the low JCL lines. So it's going to be really this sort of combination, case by case, of uh, better empirical modeling and uh, better physical modeling to fully inform everything that's going on in the high redshift. What else? Can you just go back a few slides? I was interested in. Uh, yeah. So. I guess to some extent, this uh, using cross correlations. Well, how much does it depend on the knowledge of the galaxy? I guess the galaxies that you're cross correlating with, right? Or the lensing field that you're cross correlating with, right? I mean, so in, in terms of something like the lensing field, that's kind of the, the lensing map. The shear map is basically the dark matter. Although that is again modulo intrinsic alignments and things like that. Um, so, yeah, I agree with you. Um, it's, it, it could be sort of empirical modeling all the way down um, in terms of, you know, uh, our alignment alpha emitters have the same kinds of galaxies at redshift six as they are at redshift one or two or three, right? These are the kinds of questions. Um, potentially, you know, we could think about surveys like JWST um, or even Roman. Uh, probing at the you know finer properties of individual objects to at least better inform priors on sort of the wider population, mm -hmm. even if, even if the individual observations only inform us about bright, brighter objects, it's somewhere to start, right? So, yeah, I don't have a really clear answer for you except to say we really need to come at this from all kinds of possible possible angles. <laughs> yeah. Which lines do you consider for this weak lensing cross limb analysis? So this is so this is a very simple model. Um, the principal cor correlations are going to probably come from CO43 and CO54. Like lensing kernel, right, peaks around redshift one to two. So if you think about where the lines come from, the CO lines at 200, 300 gigahertz. Whoa, up there, right? You're looking for bluish regions. So yeah, it's probably going to principally come from what like CO3 to sort of in this latter range, CO4, 3 sort of throughout, CO5, 4 more in this sort of higher frequency range. It's sort of a combined sort of tomographic cross correlation that's going on at each frequency channel. But 3, 2, 4, uh, well, 4, 3 and 5, 4 are probably principal sources of the positive cross correlation. Um, with the intrinsic alignments, it, the kernel is a little bit different. I think it probably skews a little bit higher, uh, but yeah. Do you consider like bias from the interlopers or something? We leave all the interlopers in. That's the point. Like the, even the C two is left in, although it doesn't really contribute much. Uh, everything. So in that paper, everything from CO three two, all the way down to seven six, and even the C one line, which is not shown here, that's all left in. That's left in as part of the covariance. We assume we don't remove anything like that, um, and you still obtain sort of bounded constraints on the molecular gas density, bounded constraints on the intrinsic alignment amplitude. Right, right. Like, so you consider like some of the interlopers would correlate with the lensing field? The interlopers are the only thing that correlates with the lensing field because the lensing kernel is negligible by the time you reach rest of four or five. The CUB would uh, uh, like LSST lensing, like, you know. Oh, well, yeah, you can watch it. So, yeah, in that context of cross correlating with the LSST shear data, yeah, the interloper serial lines are the only thing that really cross correlates appreciably. All right, well, it's almost here through the end of the day, right? Or yes. Yep. 
Alright, so let's thank Dongwu again. And we'll have another Astro Seminar whenever we email saying we're having another Astro Seminar. <laughs> thanks everybody on Zoom. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah,